Well, welcome again to Flame of Truth. I'm Pastor Dan Smith and uh, senior pastor at the La Sierra University Church right now. And uh, we're just uh, in a series, we're talking about the everyday Messiah. A Christ who is not just the cross Messiah, but the everyday Messiah, the one who comes into the streets and daily life that makes sense. There's a, uh, an old story, true story, that one of my fellow college pastors shared with me one time. A lady up in the middle of the valley in California had a brand new, I think, Bayliner, $22,000 ski boat. Drove it down to the lake, uh, Lake Success, Nascimento somewhere, and uh, put the boat in the water. Got in the boat and uh, turned it on. First time, it roared. And, oh, this is great. Began to go, and it just wouldn't go. And just said, what is wrong with this boat? You put the throttle down, nothing. So she said, man, $22,000. I ought to buy something better than this. Drove over to the uh, marina close by, and the guys came out, and she said, I brand new boat, first zip, something is wrong. Please check it out. So they went all over the boat, sure enough, the steering was fine, everything else was fine. One guy dove underneath to see. <laughs> Story is he came up sputtering and laughing. She hadn't taken the boat off the trailer. Put it into the water and left it on the trailer. Unhitched the boat in the The boat can go in the water like that. It's going to do what it ought to do, what it's supposed to do. There's a wrong way to do life. My first week, uh, I got to my church of La Sierra 14 years ago now. One of them came to me and, uh, in the office, and she said, Pastor Dan, what do you believe about perfection? <laughs> that's, a, that's a hot uh, potato subject, and I was willing to be careful wrong answer. They might send me back where I was. I said, ah. A long time. Matthew 5, 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Many of us have grown up uh, for afraid that you would have to be perfect before we went into the time of trouble. When your name came up in the investigative judgment, you had to be perfect with all sins out of your life, or he would uh, blot your name out of the record books of heaven perfection. At least one or two days before the close of probation, you're going to have to have it together. We're going to have to go through a time without a mediator. If there's no mediator, then you better not sin, because there's no one in the sanctuary in heaven. It's filled with smoke and the glory of God, and that's over. There's no more mediatorial ministry from Christ, uh, according to some people's view. Perfection. Well, let's see if there's another way to look at perfection today. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. There's a story of the Good Samaritan. If you want to turn to that, maybe you have a Bible with you. And let's just work through a wonderful old story, one of the classics in the Bible, the story of the Good Samaritan. A man is walking down the road. I have driven around that road. Friends of mine, the Garretties, have actually walked down the very trail where the Good Samaritan uh, perhaps walked but down. The man is attacked by robbers and beat up, and he's stripped naked and left there half dead. And then it says in Luke chapter 10, verse 31, a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Then verse 32, it says, so too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But then a Samaritan stops. He doesn't pass by. He knows this Jew would never stop for him, but he stops, takes care of him, puts him on his donkey, gives him uh, oil, takes him to a hotel, puts him in there and says, I'll pay for him until I can come back again. What does, uh, what does all this have to do with perfection and living a godly life? Well, let's look at the story. Number one. It's possible to be religious and have a shrunken heart. These were the most religious people in the world. They had the law, they had the temple, they had all that goes with Judaism. And yet they would pass by a man dying by the side of the road. They had a shrunken heart. They knew the law. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. That's in the Old Testament, not just in the New. That's in the Old 
They were supposed to hang these laws on their door and uh, have them in their heart and repeat them to their children every day. They knew the laws, and they still passed on by. Maybe they were off duty. When President Reagan was the president, he was, I was running for president, they had a, uh, pre uh, a debate, and he was just testing out the mic. Didn't think that anyone was on. He says, uh, we're announcing we're going to now bomb. Uh, <laughs> we're going to bomb the Russians. Just a joke. Someone caught it, went out over the air. Dick Vitale, famous sports announcer. One time all over the world, he just uh, spewed out a string of obscenities. He thought he was off the air, but they caught every word. So some Christians have times where they sort of go off the air. They're off the record. They're off duty. They're not, they're not on right now. And a whole other part of their life, they're passing on by. Passing on by. Don't have to stop. Maybe these Levites and priests were off duty. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to just do it now. I'm not working right now. I'm not a Levite, not a priest, not a pastor right now. I'm, uh, this, is not, this is not Sabbath or Sunday. This is not worship. This is not church. I don't have to have Christ make a difference every day, I'm off duty. And they pass on by. Maybe they had to go to a meeting. Something more important has happened to me. Bill Hybels in Willow Creek talks about, you know, preaching two sermons a week, one on the weekend, one for midweek, for 15 years, 100 sermons a year, just exhausted. And he finally says, I, I found I had a shrunken heart. I was in a store. I'm trying to get out of the store in a hurry, and a man in a wheelchair wanted to get out, and I opened the door for him, but he was going slow, and I just wanted to say, hurry up! And he realized I had a shrunken heart. I better do something about my life because something was happening to my heart. Possible to be religious and have a shrunken heart. Just to be clear, none of us can stop for everybody. None of us can take care of all suffering of the world. Every day I get an email from someone in the world who wants me to help them pay for their tuition to go to school or build their church or do something. I've done some, and so the word spreads, and I say, Pastor Dan, help me. I cannot. I cannot visit everybody in every hospital. I can't visit everyone on every street. I have 2,700 members. I cannot visit them. We cannot pass stop for everybody. But here's the point. If I don't stop, I want, to, I, I want to make sure that I'm not passing by because of a shrunken heart. I want to make sure I'm stopping for who Christ has put it on me to stop. I assume Christ will have someone else stop for other people. But when he wants me to stop, am I hearing it? Or am I passing on by because I have a shrunken heart? That's what you have to be careful of. Luke chapter 2. Number two, I think we can learn from this story a little different definition of sin. It says he got robbed on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Getting robbed kept him from getting where he wanted to go, where he was supposed to go. Most of us define sin by one text. 1 John 3, verse 4, sin is the transgression of the law. Breaking laws, breaking some set of rules that someone has given to you, making, breaking God's laws, making God mad, making God upset. Sin has to be punished and justice and will keep you out of heaven and, not, and make you go to hell. Here's a little different definition of sin. Sin is getting robbed. Letting the demons rob you of who you are supposed to be and keep you from getting where you're supposed to go, where you really wanted to go. Sin doesn't hurt God so much as it hurts you. It damages you. It keeps you from being what you want to be, what you ought to be, what God created you to be, what he wired you to be, the best life. All these books talk about, you know, live your best life now and all of that. Sin is what keeps you from being the best you could be. And so instead of being in Jericho, you're sitting by the, lying by the side of the road, bleeding. Luke is a doctor. He's the only one who puts a story into the Bible because sin is being sick. Sin is not a problem primarily with judges and laws and courtroom and jail. Sin is a problem that you are sick. And you need a doctor. You need to be healed. You need someone to come by and stop by you and help get you well again so you can go where you're supposed to go. Number three, forgiveness and grace. The good Samaritan stops. He doesn't pass by. Different religion, different culture. But it says in verse 31, a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him, bandages him, pours on oil, and wine on the wounds. 
This is the first step in the gospel in salvation. You're lying by the side of the road, you've been robbed, and Christ comes by and he is first of all the good Samaritan, and he takes care of the immediate situation. First aid, this is triage, you do the first thing that needs to be done to keep a person alive. And so Christ does for us. We, he bandages us up. And he pours oil and wine on our wounds. This is the cross, justification, forgiveness, important. It's what we need first. Keep us alive. It is what God does. And he immediately doesn't matter what we've done. He was a good Samaritan healing a Jew. Didn't matter who this one was. Doesn't matter where he's come from or what's happened to him. As if it never happened. He treats, that's the way Christ treats us. Doesn't matter where we've come from, what we've done, as if we've never sinned. That's justification, forgiveness, and grace. Takes care of the first problem, keeps you alive. John Ortberg, the pastor up in Menlo Park, used to be the teaching pastor at Willow Creek. He says there was a time he went to one of his uh, spiritual director, like a mentor in his life. And for 10 years, he'd been friends with this person. He said, I'm going to tell you everything. And in a, just a moment of catharsis, he pours out everything he'd ever done, all the evilness and blackness and, and twistedness that's in all of us. And after he brought up everything, his friend said, I've never loved you more than right now because of this openness and honesty, transparency. And Ortberg says, I wanted to break up a few more things because it felt so good to have him love me and forgive me. That's what Jesus does, the first gift of salvation the bandage, and the oil, and the wound, the cross of justification. Those most powerful healing words, to know that someone knows everything about you and loves you just the way you are, as if it never happened. We had a uh, staff retreat one time with the pastoral staff, and one of them suggested, what is the most embarrassing moment you've ever had preaching? And they went around, what about you, Pastor Dan? I have hundreds of moments where you just have said something stupid, something wrong, shouldn't have said it that way, tore up a Bible one time trying to make an illustration. Bad idea. One time I pulled the plug on the whole Heritage Singer concert. Shouldn't have happened. <laughs> pulled the wrong cord. One time we were ordaining a young elder in our church, college student, and his name was Von Nelson, but I kept saying Mark in my ordination prayer because I talked the night before with another young man named Mark, and I was so obsessed with helping getting him into ministry that I'd confused the two names, and someone was behind me whispering, it's Vaughn, it's Vaughn. One time I was doing a wedding, and the man's young name, name was uh, Ned. Somehow I'd written in my nose, Ben, and I kept calling him Ben all the way through the vows, and the bride had to say, it's Ned, it's Ned. All oh, these mistakes. And we have to be forgiven and have someone stop and pour, put bandage and pour oil and wine. That's forgiveness in Christ. That's the first stage of salvation. But the next stage now is we have to get well. It says in Luke chapter 10, verse 34, then he put the man on his donkey. Then he took him to an inn and took care of him. Then the next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you. After the first stop, you stop by the side of the road and just do first aid and do the emergency, the, P, the EMT people, what it takes to keep someone alive. But then there's more. There's a then. After that, there's a then. Then he had done enough for him by the side of the road to keep him alive, but not enough to get him home, not enough to make him fully alive and well, able to do all that he wanted to do, just enough to keep him alive. And so there's more. It was not enough for him to finish his trip, to get where he really wanted to go. And that's why Christ has more. There's a then for the Good Samaritan to stop by and do more. The first step, stop the bleeding. Keep him alive. There's a second step, get him well enough to go all the way home. I'll give you enough money, and then I'll do more until he's home. That's when you're done. The gospel is not just forgiveness, not just first aid, not just keeping alive, not just saying, I will love you no matter what. The Good Samaritan was not done until the man was well, until he was home, until he had gone to where he wanted to go. He'd gone all the way home to be with his family. I have people in our church, we have the large church, there's always somebody with cancer. Every day it seems like someone else, someone came to me last night, I've got breast cancer. 
And then they go and do proton therapy, cancer, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, something. And then I want to know, are they cancer free? What we really want to know is, are they going to make it to the end of their life? Are they going to live out a normal lifespan? Or is it going to come back? We want it gone, not just a temporary remission for a while. We want it to be gone, to be well. I don't worry about perfection anymore. I don't worry about the time of trouble. I don't worry about the close of probation. I don't worry even about keeping all the laws and all the rules perfectly. I focus on getting well. I want God to heal whatever hole and damage is in my heart that makes me want to do things that dishonor God, hurt the people around me in my life, or hurt me. I don't want to let the demons keep me from getting to be all that I could be, the dream that I have and that God has for me. That's what I want. I want to be able to get home and be well with my family and be the best I can be. That's what, if your main definition of sin is breaking laws, then perfection has to be keeping all the laws perfectly. With the prodigal son story, the definition of sin is when you leave the father's house. Why would you leave the Father's house? But then perfection is getting back home. With a Good Samaritan story, perfection is when you are home and you are well. When you have gotten all the way home and all that you want to be, that's when you're well. That's what perfection is. And the good news of the gospel is that the Good Samaritan pays for everything. Here's two silver coins. And when I get back, if they need more, I will pay for the rest. He pays for it all. This is my Uncle Maury Venden kind of territory where uh, I know he's too, uh, too old now and sick and not able to say all that he'd like to say. But his mission, my Uncle Maury's mission, was to preach justification and sanctification. Sanctification is just as free as justification. It's all by grace. Yes, you are going to work. Yes, you are going to do some things to spend time with God and to have your life transformed. It's going to be a cooperation, yes but it is all free by the power of God. The good Samaritan pays for it all. And God will pay for it all. One by forgiveness, one by giving you transforming power to become all that you want to be, to be healed. And then to go to be all that you were supposed to be. Christ pays it all. It is not justification, it's Christ's blood, sweat, and tears. And now sanctification is your blood, sweat, and tears. It is Christ. Christ. And he has enough. Moore's old illustration was someone buys you a Cadillac and it gives you a gift. But it's up to you to continue to make the rest of the payments, to pay for the gas and pay for the insurance. And you say, I can't. I can't. Christ says, I'll take care of that too. I'll pay it all. One more thing about this. The good Samaritan leaves and he promises to come back. And Christ leaves. And what does he say? I'll come back. But in the meantime, I will leave you the Holy Spirit. Here's our two silver coins until I come back. This will keep you until I come back. Take care of him. Get him healed. Get him well while I am gone. And then I will come back. And Christ says, I'm going to go. It will be better for you. I will leave the Holy Spirit. And he will get you well. He will get you well. Then I will come back. And so the Holy Spirit is the transition. The book of Acts is when they began to be healed. This was Christ. When they healed people, it was Christ. Christ is the one who healed you, not me, Christ. Christ was in heaven, but through the Holy Spirit, it was still Christ who was healing them. The risen, resurrected, in heaven, ascendant Christ was the one who was healing. And so Christ comes into our life today. He is still the good Samaritan. He stops by the side of the road. He came down to our world and died on the cross, and he gave us the first day to keep us alive with forgiveness and justification on the cross. And he gave us the oil and the bandages and the wine. And then he says, I'll take you to the end and I'll pay. And he sent us the Holy Spirit to finish the healing process until we become all that God wants us to be. I read a story the other day about Chuck Yeager, the famous test pilot, the X-1, X-15, all of that. And evidently there was a plane that they were uh, studying, experimental jet. Every time they did a roll, the ailerons would freeze up and pilots died. Four pilots died. And I just said, boy, something is wrong. A little exciting. You're 150 feet above the ground, flying upside down, and your ailerons freeze up. So it happened to him. Somehow he, he did it, and he pulled the nose up, and the ailerons came unstuck, and he was able to come out of it. So he said, oh, I think I figured it out. He went up higher, tried it again, 
and he made it happen again and he fixed it again. And he came back down and he told the engineers, here's what's wrong. This was what's happening. And they went down into the plane and they found one bolt that was in upside down. They went to the assembly line and there was an old man on the assembly line who had always put the bolt in a certain way on the top and so on the bottom, he put it in that way too when he should have put it the other way. And in your life, there may be one thing that's just not the way it's supposed to be. And it has to be fixed. It has to be healed. I tell people who have some problems, that just get it fixed. God has forgiven it, but get it fixed because it's keeping you from being the flying the way you want it to fly. There's a right way to fly and a wrong way to fly. I have a family in our church, Don and Heather Miller's at their house. Huge rock in the backyard, in the way of what they would like to do with their backyard and garden. They say, why don't you get rid of it? We can't. What are we going to do with it? I said, do what the Filipinos do. They dig a big hole. Then they put the rock down in the hole and cover it up. Oh, it's too big, too big. And most of us, we get everything else done. We lie on landscape, beautiful grass and flowers. But there's one rock that's in the way. There's one thing in your life that just is getting in the way of being all that you want to be. Get it out of the way. Get the trader off the boat. And George Brown uh, used to be the president of the Inter-American Division, preached in my church the other night, told the story, Trinidad, Tobago. There was uh, some, some pastor found a wallet by the side of the road. Turns out it was the wallet of the finance minister of Trinidad, Tobago. Call him up. I have your wallet. Oh, thank you. I'll come and get it. No, no, we're coming to you. Walked into the office, handed him the wallet. What can I do for you? Well, there is something. Our college out here is struggling. We needed to have a big printing press. We asked uh, you, the government, for some money. You loaned us $18 million. We're supposed to pay it back, $18 million Trinidad dollars. But we haven't, it hasn't worked. The presses aren't working. Somehow the whole project has died. And our college is struggling to pay you back this $18 million. We cannot survive as a college. Would you, would you do something about that? And they forgave that debt. One thing was getting in the way of the college thriving and flourishing. Most of us have one or two things. It's just getting in the way. And God says, let me pay for that. Let's get it healed. Let's get it out of your life so you can go home and be all that you want to be. We want to, Willow Creek, the church in Chicago, says we want to take irreligious people and turn them into fully devoted followers of Christ. That's what we want to be, fully devoted, not partially, not just still by the side of the road. We've been bandaged up, but still pretty beat up. We want to be healed. We want to be back home, all fully devoted to Christ. We'll take a moment or two to talk about what I'm talking about, Academy Awards. When I preached this in my church years ago, we were talking about teachers, teachers in our schools. Aren't you thankful for all the teachers? But this could be anybody who has the job of mentoring people, passing on beliefs and passing on education and knowledge and values to the next generation. And I said to my church, aren't you thankful for the Good Samaritans in our schools? This week we're preaching to our faculty again. It's Education Week this and week in my church. Aren't you thankful for our teachers who could go and work someplace else, but they come into a school and they stop for your child and for mine. They stop and they put a bandage on and they teach kids and they spend all day, every day, listening, teaching, mentoring, being an example to kids. You change the world. It's a hard job. Maybe the hardest job in the world. But no job has more power to change, to take someone who's standing by the side of the road. One of our children who's been damaged, they're born into a sinful world with sin in their lives, and we put them into a school, and teachers are part of the process, and our youth pastors, and our Sabbath school leaders, all the people who are raising kids, helping us do that. They are the Good Samaritans, and we just need to honor the Good Samaritans in our life who are willing to stop, don't pass by, and they stop by for your kids and mine. And they are the baseball coaches and the sports coaches, and they do vacation Bible school, and they pour their life into kids. Thankful for all the others who are caregivers and doctors and nurses and people all over the world who pour their, who don't pass by. And we need to give them the Academy Awards. We give the Academy Award to the movie stars and all the famous people and the beautiful people, and the whole world stops and says, how are you? How, we need to have an Academy Award for the teachers and the doctors and the nurses and the caregivers and the people in the nursing homes and the pastors and youth pastors and youth leaders and Sabbath school teachers and all the others who do not pass by. The missionaries around the world, the people who suffer. We just came back from Thailand. 
the people who give their lives to someone else. Someday in heaven, there's going to be an Academy Award red carpet, and they will walk on by, and God will honor every single one and give them an Academy Award. Thank the people in your life who are teachers and pastors and people who are caregivers, your parents, and to say thank you for not passing by. Mr. Holland's opus, famous story, was a music, music teacher up in Oregon, always wanted to uh, write great music, to write the opus, the final, the epic work, but was always teaching music lessons and band and choir. Music programs are always the first program to quit when the taxes don't have enough money to pay for everything in the school. His program was going to be cut. And he goes into the school to get his last things out. And there's an assembly going on. Even the governor has come. And they're all going to play his opus, Mr. Holland's opus. And he realized that his life meant something. We need to honor the teachers and the people who have been the Good Samaritans in our lives. But of course, we want to honor ultimately Jesus, who, yes, came down on the cross and stopped, did not pass on by when you and I were lying by the side of the road, bleeding. And he stopped, and he died for us, and he gave us the bandages, first aid, kept us alive, kept us breathing, oil and wine. But also the Christ who puts us on the donkey and takes us to the inn, and he said, let me send you the Holy Spirit. He will make you well, and I'll pay for everything, and then I will come back, and I will finish the process. And so Jesus is the one, the Good Samaritan, who heals it all. May you and I be healed. May we become fully devoted followers of Christ. And may we somehow end up where we want to go, where we get home with our families, and we are the dream of what God made for us to be. May the Good Samaritan come to you today. Mm -hmm.